I'm psyched to do five questions with Roger Burnett, one of the co-founders of Promo Cares and the founder of Social Good Promotions um, and just a general all around awesome dude. And I'm hoping that um, these five questions will let us all learn a little more about what drives you and what gets you up in the morning and in particular, why you're passionate about Promo Cares and yeah. your mission. So um, I'm yeah. gonna, I'm gonna, first question is just, you're a founding member of the Promo Cares board. I'm like a late comer honor. Um, and, uh, but I'm just curious, like, what was the impetus? Like, what's that origin story and, and what drove starting Promo Cares? Yeah, we got it. We got to give Danny as much credit as he's due. He won't, when it becomes his turn to do this, he won't. So we're going to do it. And if you've known Danny for any length of time, one of the big mantras he used to promote all the time was kindness should be a KPI. He's been saying that forever. And I think for many of us, when you hear something like that, it either resonates with you or it just doesn't. And so for me, it always has resonated. It speaks very much to sort of who I am as a person as well. And so our friendship is really multifaceted, but it, there is definitely an element of what makes us such good friends it, from this shared belief that like that should be a thing, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so... I was re-entering the promotional products marketplace after a brief exit, and I co-founded a industry supplier called Branded Logistics with Jonathan Irvin. We were trying to get that supplier up and running, and we didn't have much in the way of marketing budget, and I was boohooing to Danny about the fact that I didn't really have the money to break into all of the enterprise accounts that I was going to need in order to sell a lot of OtterBox phone cases, and he said to me, hey, fast. Who, which supplier in the industry does the most good? The answer is Sandmar. Everybody knows that. It's just because they are who they are and the, the uh, charge that they've led when it comes to CSR is undeniable. So that was an easy answer. But then we started to explore what would be the second and third and fourth choices. And it became very difficult, very quick. Mm -hmm. The list was short. For us to like, who qualifies? Mm -hmm. And so... Danny said to me, he was like, well, you know, what if you just made like that your marketing plan? And if there's a way for you to competitively differentiate yourself that might allow you a side door into some mm -hmm. of these accounts, it would mm -hmm. be something along those lines that may get you the access that you otherwise won't be able to get. Brilliant strategy, very core to my why. I didn't mm -hmm. need to sort of like manufacture this. It made it mm -hmm. relatively easy. Mm -hmm. But in return, what I said to him was, hey, man, I think there's something more to that. I think that not only should I be thinking about that, but isn't that the way that the promotional marketing industry might be able to collectively differentiate itself from the other marketing medium out there that people are spending money on? And if we could do a better job of telling that story, maybe we would make our products be a little less price sensitive. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's how it started. The whole thing got started, yeah. Right, right. What's the first thing Promo Cares did that you can remember as a like, you know, entity that somebody could point a finger at and say, "Oh, Promo Cares did X." What was the first thing? Like, so you got a few people together that were yeah. passionate about what you're passionate about. Yeah. Then what happened? So we're sitting around a table at Expo, like in the 700 level that nobody knows about in this like secret area. And this group of people came together around a request that Danny and I had made to say, like, can we have this exploratory discussion about what we might do collectively as an industry to help raise our importance? And so it's Danny, myself, Tony Wavering, David Schultz, and Bill Petrie, who all decide that we're going to kind of be the attractors of the participants of this meeting. It's... 20 minutes before showtime and none of us know what we're going to talk about, who's going to lead the meeting or anything. We had no idea exactly what we wanted to do, but mm -hmm. we knew that by virtue of whom had said yes, that there was going to be a lot of firepower in the room. So we wanted to, to, to figure out a way to try to harness that. So line luck, I stood up, I introduced myself and I started talking about the nonprofit that was most impactful to me in my personal life and why. Mm -hmm. And that started the conversation 
by which everyone at that table legitimately with no advanced prodding was able to regurgitate what their personal version of that story Yeah, their was. mantra, their, yeah. And it was those stories, Denise, that largely comprised the efforts of promo cares in the very early days. It right. was like, these stories deserve the light of day. Yeah. And it's our job to go tell them. So I took personal responsibility to serve as the reporter and the gatherer, gatherer of those stories. And then it was my job really to um, use our social media presence that we had individually, which was pretty good at that point, mm -hmm. to be able to spread the message about all of these amazing things that people were doing in our industry that almost no one knew about. Yep. And I mean, that's always been the mandate, educate and inspire, right? Find the stories, but also like find, you know, I think, I think, you know, find the way forward and, and give people the toolkit to get there. So, so let's fast forward a little bit. Um, so some major philanthropic initiatives have come out of Promo Cares in the last, um, you know, few years. I think we've collectively raised over 70 grand. We're launching Water for Good, our third major campaign. Um, water is a human right. And um, I'm curious, how has the focus of Promo Cares changed since it started? Yeah, right. So the joke that I used to tell in the early days of the movement, if you want to call it that, is, you know, people would be like, well, what, what is this, you know, what, what's the objective? And it's, a, it's not an objective, it's a collaboration. The mm -hmm. idea is, if we are a group of people who all have a similar belief, then we should collect, collectively be able to do things together by virtue of our shared desire to make an impact in this way. And that's what's made Promo Care so amazing because we went from cheerleader to teacher in the process. And we, what we didn't know when we first got going was not so much that we would never get here, but what vehicles that would take shape in. Yeah. So the objective was really to try to get people who shared our passion for this together so that we could build the kind of trust-based relationships that could reveal things like fundraisers that suddenly are capable of raising ridiculous amounts of money in very short periods of time because the people who are behind this at Promo Cares are very well connected within the industry and we're seen sort of as like, oh, they're doing that? Okay, yeah. well, something that we would be interested in doing. And you have to make an investment in time and effort and staying true to your cause to give yourself enough runway for the people that you want to see you that way to see you that way. Yeah. Yeah. And we've given ourselves by virtue of this collective effort that we've been able to put together and the people who we've been able to draft into the cause, yourself included, the opportunity to really realize like, oh, we could be fundraisers. Yeah, we can do this. Yeah. And to not only be fundraisers, but for big stuff, like mm -hmm. stuff that a lot of other folks in the industry aren't necessarily willing to sign up to try to tackle. Is um is there risk that Promo Cares becomes a fundraising agency and yeah. doesn't tackle some of the other issues that relate to DE&I and, uh, you know, environmental impact and human rights in our supply chain? Like, is that, do you see yeah. that, you know, as a risk or do you see that as maybe that's not our mandate anymore or mandate at all? Or, you know, like, where's that? How does that land for you? The beauty of a volunteer organization to me is when people come to the party, they're usually doing it because what's going on speaks to them. And I think we more so than maybe any other group in the industry have made it very clear. Like we know what our broad big top is, but what we need are people who are passionate about each of the elements of what we've articulated mm -hmm. as what we'd like to see our group be able to tackle. But we can't as the core group keep trying to ex expand the things that we are trying to handle because some of it is outside of our knowledge base and mm -hmm, some of it is mm -hmm, outside of our mm -hmm. experience base. So, but we would certainly welcome anyone who came to us and said like, diversity is important to me and I would like to be involved in bringing awareness and teaching to your community about this topic. I mean, 
that that's right exactly on. yeah and i think there's been with the group has been the you know promo cares has been super effective through podcasts and in the such of like blowing out the broader issues in terms of like this is the conversation we all need to be having whether or not on the ground the boots on the ground is doing work in that area i think the boots on the ground for promo cares has been always been really effective around this fundraising it's awesome yeah. it's like it's sort of magical even as a board member to sort of bear witness to it um yeah. so let's pivot a little bit um third question of five questions um how have you seen the marketplace change since your time in the industry and how are you you know positioning social good promotions to succeed yo yikes right so what's interesting about social good promotions is it was not born until promo cares was a year old mm -hmm. and what that year, and you know, Denise, you'll remember, I was the one spending every hour of every Sunday scouring the internet, trying to find examples that I could present to the Promo Cares community of evidence that this is an actual thing. And from then to now, like the look, the search is infinitely easier, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, and especially with what you're watching going on in the US from a legislative perspective, like there are specters on the horizon around what this means and how you're going to be able or need to be able to survive inspection in a way that could not only get you in sort of societal trouble, but depending on what goes on with legislation, you might get in actual trouble. Yeah. And yeah. it's going to be really interesting to watch. And then there's this whole debate going on in the B Corp movement about how B Labs have certified some people that kind of have raised some eyebrows. So like, what is, is that cheapening what that certification means? Because many of us are seeking that certification. So to me, what, where I come out on this is if you're doing it right, you are owning a lane in our big top. And I'm not trying to say I have it exactly the same way that Fairware does it or the way that Danny does it or the way the Reciprocity Road Group collectively approaches what they do, our approach is core to our values. Mm -hmm. And if you wanna ask me how I'm going about doing it, I'm going to answer you within the context of our company's core values, mm -hmm. which I believe is the way I defend the inspection that someone might seek. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of the kind work. Of the, it's kind of the only way, right? And it also, yeah. as you scale and grow, without that anchor to a founder owner's personal commitment or passion, yeah. it's kind of hard to keep it going. You right. know what I mean? Like you can't, right. you're not going to hang your hat on someone else's train. It's got to, you got to be on your own ride, you know? And, and, uh, and I think that's what makes every brand in our space unique, whether you're a supplier or distributor, like what, what is important to you? And I think you're, you know, I think we're all have to meet certain thresholds to say, this is, you know, we are a social purpose or sustainability focused brand. I mean, you've got to have some certain check boxes to, you know, look people in the eye and say that legitimately. But if you're really going to succeed, you need to do it in your own way. You know, otherwise it's going to be kind of like, meh, it's going to feel checkboxy. It's like, it's like <laughs> you know? who cares? We're all yeah. musicians. Mm -hmm. Who cares is music and we each interpret it our own way. Absolutely. But when we're together, it's like we can jam together because we yeah. all kind of have the same vibe. Yeah. We just might be doing it in ways that are not identical. And in reality, that's what makes it so awesome because as we continue to build our body of work as a group, someone who stumbles upon us and realizes like, oh, these are my people, mm -hmm. they just immerse themselves in what other folks are doing. It gives you a really great template to imagine how you would do it yourself. Don't copy us. Or yeah. if you do, do copy if yeah. you have to a little bit, but eventually you're going to come to your own conclusion about like, what does this sound like for me? Exactly. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, that kind of leads in, you touched on this a little bit, but I, this is sort of question number four for me. Where is our industry still off the back when it comes to social and environmental responsibility and and what do we need to do as distributors and suppliers to kind of collectively up our game and how do you think promo cares can support that work yeah yeah um
there's an argument to be made that promo cares work is at the top of Maslow's hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And that there are people out there that just need to make a dollar. Mm -hmm. And I get it. Right. So, and our industry is constructed in a way that will forever and for always foster a certain amount of like, I'm just getting the order. And trying to pretend like that's not going to happen isn't going to change things. But what we who are doing this part of it can do is to collectively get a little bit more consultative or steely in our like, not just going to let you do what you think you're going to do without putting you through a little bit of inspection first. Mm -hmm. So that maybe what we get you ultimately is a better reflection of what you were really trying to do so that it doesn't get thrown away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, like if we can just reduce the amount of intellectualization that we want to bring to this discussion and take it down to the legitimate level of be the distributor that they buy because your stuff doesn't, your choices don't get thrown in the garbage, mm -hmm. period. And if we can just start that off as the base level conversation that we can all ascribe to, and the likelihood of our industry surviving the long term increases. It just does. So mm -hmm. whether or not we're able to do that or not really remains to be seen. So, mm -hmm. but I'm going to tell you a quick story, Denise. What okay. one of the earliest, <laughs> earliest presentations I gave was to a group of distributors at the OPA uh, end user event. And Kira Keister, who was OPA's president at that point, was my hostess. She and I didn't even know each other, but she got to stand on stage with me and watch the reaction of the audience when I stood on stage and said, the distributor who invited you here today is worried that you're going to leave them and go to Amazon. Hmm. The eyeballs that people got because they didn't know that that's what I was going to tell their end buyer customers. But what I went on to explain to them was why buying from Amazon is a bad choice, mm -hmm. including that you're never going to be as good as the person sitting next to you because they've invested some of ridiculous amount of time in their careers to getting really good at knowing about product and decoration mm -hmm. and all of those things. So to think that you're just going to be better than them because you can go online and buy something ensures two things. One, you're going to end up with some crap that you never give away. And two, you're going to have an overall generally not very happy opinion of promotional marketing items because you never really got the value add of the experience of the person. So yeah. what I feel like we've done as, as promo cares is we've upped that even one more. Right. Yeah. It's not just, oh, I know it's this factory because of their decoration capabilities. It's like, yeah, well, that might be the case too, but they also do this. Mm hmm and what I've learned about you, Mr. Customer, is you also believe in this. So the fact that I sourced this from that factory makes it something that you can go talk about now when you give it away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the big difference to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if we can all just take that one additional step of why they should buy this thing and why, mm -hmm. and have it be defendable, then we win as an industry. Yeah, Period. absolutely. All right. It's five years from now. What's the promo? Um, so it's five years from now. What does promo cares look like in your yeah. dream of dreams? Yeah, this one. This one was fun to sort of daydream about. So um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pull from our co-founders playbook one more time and talk about Danny Rosen. If you just go out to your Googler and Google Danny Rosen promo industry manifesto. And there's a document out there that lays the groundwork for what all of us who are serious about still being around in five years need to really be thinking about. And within that document, there are a number of different topics. But one of the things that I believe from what he wrote to be increasingly possibly true because of things like chat GPT and BARD and a lot of the AI and ML that we're seeing be released now in these large language models is we're going to be able to get a lot better at predicting what people will want. And if we make the investment in learning the tools, we should be able to present yet another competitive advantage to our buyers because we're going to be able to articulate that in a way that I'm not saying won't be able to be done online. It will be able to. But if people are lazy and they just want someone to pick something for them, 
And this is going to make our jobs infinitely easier. And consequently, what I hope is that we have a future where the promotional marketing industry is not getting thrown away as much. So if we continue our practice within Promo Cares of being very instructive about how the use of promotional marketing items can solve problems for customers, we will continue to be able to provide value to our community of people and probably even be able to be even more targeted and even more specific about the ways that we're going to be able to, to do that in a way that still shows us as kind of being a leader in the space. But it's definitely bound for some evolution, and I'm super excited yeah. to see how that's going to play out. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So uh, this is a little bonus question. How do people get involved with Promo Cares? Well, uh, we got a little fundraiser thingy going on right now that people might want to jump, jump in on. So uh, as you mentioned earlier in our discussion, we've been very adept at fundraising. And we continue to try to find larger and more important issues to tackle. So here we are in the midst of our Water for Good campaign that's going to run for the entirety of Q2. And Denise, what's really unique to me about Water for Good is this is the first time that we as Promo Cares have gone from an industry-centric fundraising model to something that we as distributors can actually take to our clients and be able to have them participate with us in this activation of building water towers in a village in Mexico to the point where they can then themselves be able to point to that purchase as a part of their own marketing campaign around whatever it is they're going to do with the items that they're going to buy. And to me, this is like the next evolution of what's going on with promo care. So whether or not you have something that you're passionate about that you really want to bring to the board as something that you might want to actually volunteer, stand up and devote your time to within the organization. Anyone who believes in the Promo Cares mantra has the opportunity to take the Water for Good campaign to market. And as far as I'm concerned, you should. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in doing that, there's a Facebook group out there that you can join that we will put in the link to this interview to give you the opportunity to be able to find that out because we're going to try to use that as a bit of an incubator to foster some best practices around how distributors are getting their clients to actually sign up to participate. So if you want to get taught by a group of your peers about how this is playing out for everybody, what a great opportunity. And it's not gonna last for just a few days, it's gonna last for the entirety of the quarter, which is super fun. So I'm looking yeah. forward to it. I, hope I think it's an easy gateway to kind of cut your teeth on this stuff too, like you said, like learn how to do it, learn how to bring it to your clients, see how they respond and, and right. uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a goodie. Um, you're awesome. Yeah. I'm grateful that I get to sit on a board with you, and uh, I hope everyone gets a little uh, little more insight into what makes you tick, Roger. Yeah. Thanks for being you. Thanks for doing it, Denise. All I right. appreciate it. Cheers.